Hello, my name is Chris Kurzik, and I'm the Principal Engineer at Athabasca Engineering Solutions, AES for short. And uh, what does AES do? Well, first of all, we provide third-party value evaluations. We provide training and certification. We provide equipment re-rating. Welcome again to our program. In this video, we are going to talk about part two of API 579. Part two is what I nickname the, the roadmap. It basically provides some groundwork definitions and sort of the philosophy of how it's structured and a little introduction to the remaining parts, which are the, um, the parts pertaining to the flaw mechanisms. So I'm gonna go through this quickly here. So the first part is the is the organization and, and procedures for fitness for service. And that will include the fitness for service continued operation organization of flaw mechanisms. And 2.2 will do will deal with uh, procedures for pressurized and unpressurized components, component definitions construction codes, uh, specific applicability and limitations. Part 2.3 of the 216 edition is the uh, data requirements. So the data requirements will include original equipment design data, maintenance and operating history, required data measurements for field assessment, recommendations for technique and size and criterion, and the fourth part of this is the assessment techniques, and that'll include the introduction of assessment levels and acceptance criteria and data uncertainties. And so our presentation for, for episode one will deal with sections one to three in more detail. Now the other criterion that are, that are in part two is called remaining life assessment, remediation, in-service monitoring, documentation, and Annex A to F, which is a more detailed description of um, the procedures for doing calculations and the, criteria, like the acceptance criterion of what their recommendations are. Part two has a lot of procedures and methods and they're contained within the annexes. So annex 2A, for example, is a technical basis and validation for the FFS procedure. And the, this is referenced in all the other parts where there's, they, they'll deal it directly with specific mechanisms. And then we have 2B, which is the damage mechanisms, which are, which are defined and described. The, the thickness and MAP and stress calculations, 2D, the stress analysis overview, materials properties, 2F, alternate remaining strength factors. Part two, the general notes is sort of the roadmap for, for API 579, some very general statements are made with regards for fitness for service and continued operation. First of all, there's some notes about evaluation. It's primarily intended for pressurized components containing flaws or damage. There's some brief discussions about when, when, when the evaluation has a pass, you are allowed to continue uh, provided that there's monitoring inspection programs in place. The second part, it talks briefly about failure, remedial action to reduce, for example, remedial action can be to reduce pressure and temperature or the liquid level in the tank. We continue with the organization procedure they continue with the overall roadmap for 
flaw types and damage mechanisms in this section. They introduce figure 2.1, which will be shown in the next slide. It's sort of a chart of the hierarchy of all the types of flaws. And then in table 2.1, they, they've gone the extra mile and provided definitions. I want to bring to your attention figure 2.1 because it's one of the most important diagrams that are used as sort of a road map for working through 579. So the damage classes, as it were alluded to earlier, are classified under the following groups. If uh, there can be brittle fractures, corrosion erosion, crack like flaws, fire damage, creek damage, mechanical damage, and fatigue damage. Now you can have combinations of those, but say for example, you have a corrosion erosion, then they recommend, 579 recommends going to part four, part five, six, and seven uh, for these sections. And, is, and likewise for creep going to part 10 of the standard. Again, th these are organized by the flaw type and there can be multiple um, applicate multiple damage mechanisms. Section 2.13 does an overview of the procedures that are found in the remaining sections of the standard. Basically, it's an eight step system that they follow. First of all, step number one is flaw and damage mechanism identification. And um, basically with that, that you want to look at the materials of construction, the service history, environmental conditions that can be used to ascertain the likelihood of the damage. An overview of damage mechanisms can assist you in identifying the, these kind of damage mechanisms. And basically, you would be going to something, a section in here, part two, called Annex 2B. Step two is the applicability and limitations of the FFS standard assessment procedures. The, the applicability and limitations of the assessment procedures are described in each part. So we alluded there was a part 10 and you would go to those specific parts. And there's a discussion on whether to proceed with the assessment can be made at those st stages. Part three are data requirements, and we'll get into that in a little bit as well. Data required for the, the assessment will depend on the flaw type and the damage mechanisms. Part four, assessment techniques and acceptance criteria provided for each uh, applicable part. Step five, the remaining life evaluation. This is an estimate of the remaining life or limiting flaw size that could be made for establishing the inspection interview, interval for, and this is a, an estimate for, for future damage. Remediation. Remediation refers to techniques that may be used to control future damage associated with flaw growth and material deterioration, deterioration excuse me. Uh, seven is in-service monitoring. So each, uh, each part has its own damage mechanism. So you have to refer to each section for that one. And um, where it can't be, um, in-service monitoring is, is, is important when there's not enough information or the damage mechanism is so complex that you can't accurately determine the, the period, or if the, if the remaining life is very short, um, then you, you need to consider a in-service monitoring. Okay, we're gonna go back to figure 2.1. This is actually part step one, the flaw, damage, and 
mechanism identification. And this is what the, they use to determine that. So for example, there could be a, uh, a part six damage and there could be some uh, other issues like assessment of misaligned shell deteriorations of part eight. And it depends on the locations and everything, but the art of doing the analysis is combining these, these uh, parts together. Step two, applicability and limitations, section 2.2 of the assessment procedures. The procedures are designed primarily for pressurized uh, components, but they allow it to be used for unpressurized components provided um, you know that you're using the, the proper methods. Um, component definition, any part that is designed and fabricated um, must be, you know, it's recommended be it is rec designed to a recognized code. And this includes construction codes. And, and there's one thing that one has to realize is API is all developed based upon ASME margins. And so if you're deviating from that, extra care must be um, given because they're based on the principles of ASME. And the, you, there has to be more thought involved if you're using some uh, like a design outside of that. Specific applicability and limitations uh, are is a this part describes includes a statement of the applicability and limitations for the procedures. Now the data requirements. This is quite a handy table. I find this one quite nice because it, it basically outlines exactly what you need for doing, you know, a pressure vessel and boiler components. And there's a very, very precise list of what is required. And so uh, they, you know, and then of course there's one for um, the um, piping components. And there's one also for tanks. And uh, basically, as an example uh, of one, for example, pressure vessel components, this list I was mentioning, uh, the list has lots of good stuff there. Like you don't have to rewrite your email. You can just give them this list, like your ASPE manufacturer's data report, fabrication drawing showing sufficient details to permit the calculation of maximum allowable working pressure, component containing the flaw, the original or updated design calculation, load cases. And it refers to Annex 2C, which is in part two, which is the focus of discussion. Uh, table 2C3. There's also inspection records for each component at the time of fabrication, user design specification if the vessel is designed to ask me, section 8 division 2 material test reports we need, pressure relieving devices including pressure relief valve and rupture disc settings and capacity information, a record of original hydro test including test pressure uh, metal temperature at the time of the test, or if the temperature is unavailable, the water or ambient temperature. So there's a lot of really good information in there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. More on step three, data requirements, maintenance and operating history. So basically uh, the actual pressure and temperature, the actual Operating envelope consisting of the pressure and temperature, significant changes in service or conditions, including pressure and temperature, fluid and corrosion rate, all alternations and repairs included. And I find that the inspection companies have gotten a lot better at, at doing this, um, following these criteria, because uh, API has gone to such an extent to really explain things. And it's just a matter of accessing uh, part two. Uh, you know, service changes, um, you know, results of in prior service examinations, wall thickness, NDE requirements that may determine the structural integrity of the component. We're talking about, you know, repairs that have were done, 
and all internal records, uh, we, you know, weld, buildups, uh, overlays, even uh, all those records could, are, should must be taken into account, including, you know, post weld, post treat, uh, post weld heat treat procedures to determine how much remaining post weld heat treat is left. Uh, all those can be included, uh, especially for the more detailed analysis, and of course the hydro tests. I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.